All right. So, um, yes, that's me and this is me. And, and here we go. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. And if you're still sticking around, I'm really glad that you're here. As Emma mentioned, we're going to take a, a pause break where we'll answer some questions. And then we'll also do that at the end as well. So um, you're bound to have questions, especially with a lot of novices getting started. So ask away. No dumb question. Please go for it. Um, you can put them in the chat as well. So let's just real quick, what are we doing tonight? What is iNaturalist? Rob mentioned it, Emma mentioned it, Mike mentioned it. Um, how does the NAT use iNAT? And then how to contribute. So we're gonna learn how to join a project like the one that Rob mentioned, Never Home Alone, and then add an observation to that project. So if you did download the app and you logged in and everything, you'll be able to upload one tonight. And so we're talking about you guys participating in scientific research. And so at the NAT, we call this citizen science or community science. Um, basically, it's people helping out formal researchers. Like Rob was saying, um, I think he made an eloquent point of there's so much out there we don't know exists. And scientists can't be everywhere. And we need your help big time. There's still a lot to explore. So that is exactly what we do with community science. It's been with us since our founding as a museum and we still do it today. Um, so we hope that you'll join us if you haven't yet. And you can actually find more about the projects that we do by going to our website. Um, we're at the, on the events and citizen science and we'll have this all um, in a wrap up email that we share with you all. So, so that's kind of overview of citizen science and community science and what is iNaturalist? So iNaturalist is actually um, a data mapping app and it's also um, kind of social media in a way, but it enables anybody with a computer or a smart device, an iPhone, an iPad to document plants and animals, the natural world all around them, and then share it with scientists, share it with other nature lovers, share it with people that don't love nature, but are just wanting to see what's in their area or areas they're going to go explore. So there are a lot of ways to use iNaturalist, and we're just going to really tip of the iceberg here tonight. We're just going to show you how to upload an observation, but I highly suggest you get into it more and you go online on the website. There's kind of more capabilities there to play around with it. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions too. I'll have my email um, share that out. So feel free to reach out to me. And you will see um, Levi Passmore here with a giant tarantula on his face. Uh, he is a, an early community scientist that helped the gnat out. And um, I just love this picture. And I also know Emma can't stand spiders. So I had to throw it in there. There Emma. Um, but kind of why, how does the NAT use all this data? Um, why map all this information? So it basically it gives us a record of what is where, when. And those records change over time. Uh, like Rob mentioned, invasive species, <clears throat> or not even invasive, just new species coming into an area, or maybe things that were in an area no longer being there. Well, if we don't have a record of what was there at a certain time, we don't know if it's changed. So basically, we're just keeping a record of of what is living here when. And then we can look back, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, people will look back and say, thank God they, they saved those things because we saw things changed, um, which they couldn't do otherwise. And uh, I really like the phrase, what did he use the phrase? Oh, a, a climate gate gateway. Is that what he used? That San Diego is a climate gateway. So we're like prime spot for possibly finding new things in North America, especially in our homes, which is super exciting. That got me even more excited about why we should all be participating in this. So the NAT uses all this data. We have museum collections that are basically go back to when we found, were founded in 1874, and that is mapping all the plants and animals of our region. Um, so we already have all this in databases. And we pull things from iNaturalist, your observations, and we map them. So we combine them with collections data from the museum going back over 100 years. And then we can map these points and it lets us see where things are and where they have been. And then also look back at how that may have changed over time. So our curators are actively, like uh, Emma mentioned, John Redman in the poll. 
he's actively pulling in your observations from Nye Naturalist into his project called the Plant Atlas. And that's mapping every plant in San Diego County. You'll probably see him idea if you use Nye Naturalist. He's pretty amazing. I don't think he sleeps, um, but he is awesome. So let's get going. Let's play with Nye Naturalist. That's kind of a quick introduction. So you should have already downloaded the app made an account and logged in, which is just like an email. Um, you're going to be able to log in if you go online to inaturalist.org um, and log in there and see your stuff or from any tablet or smart device you do. And then we're going to show get, get started joining projects right now. So in order to join projects, we're going to be looking at this iPhone view right now, and then we're going to switch to Android. So if you have an Android, just hold on a moment. We'll get right to you. It's really, they're both very similar. And if you're used to using your device, they've really set it up so it's kind of intuitive, but it does take a minute to get used to. So um, on your iPhone, you want to log in and go to the more section, which is the bottom right, three little dots for iPhones usually means there's more that you can see, um, and iPads too. And then you want to choose, that will bring you to projects or guides. You're going to want to choose projects because we're going to be joining projects. Guides are a really neat thing, but they're unfortunately kind of defunct. Um, they are not, iNaturalist is no longer allowing people to make new guides or kind of investing in, in developing guides, but um, you can see old ones were, that were there. And so the idea is it's basically a guide to a certain area that somebody made. Like you can find this here, you can find that there. A lot of nature centers make them. Um, and I suggest checking them out because they are neat. Um, and you can add those to your account. But we're not gonna go into that. We're gonna go into projects. So that first little kind of briefcase there, you wanna select that. And then it's going to bring up a search icon. Um, it might take a minute. So honestly, <laughs> don't freak out if it doesn't come up. It's, it's just taking a minute if you don't see that little search icon there. Um, and we want to join Never Home Alone, right? Because Rob just got us all really excited and we have to add to it and discover new things. Um, and also, I guess, basically share like the fact that we're all living in toilets. I, I don't know, I couldn't get over that. I don't know if anybody else did that. Basically everywhere on earth is a toilet, <laughs> but I digress. Um, so you will, once that icon comes up, you can just click in and put, start typing in never. So never home alone is the name of the project. iNaturalist is really, really picky. It doesn't like misspellings and it doesn't like, um, wrong. Sometimes they'll have years on things or colons and things, and it wants you to have exactly what is there. So I find it better to do less than more in case you kind of mistype. Um, so I just put in never to see what would come up. So multiple things come up. The one we want is actually at the very bottom. It has a little spider icon. It's also on the left of this screen here, never at home alone, the wildlife of homes. Now you can click on these and it will you can read in a uh, summary about them. And so you could see if you were on the right one or not. Um, and once you do that, you click on it and you hit join. And then if it changes and it shows you leave, that means you have joined it and you are good to go and it's gonna show up in your projects. So iPhone users, you could play around with that. We're gonna go to the Android view. Android view is kind of in the opposite, the top left-hand corner, you have three bars instead of dots. That's kind of your more menu bar there. Um, you do the same thing. Here you have kind of more options, which is nice. Um, projects, guides, activity, mission settings. We're gonna go to projects. Same thing with the guides. So the guides are being um, developed more, but they are there. And I suggest checking them out. Um, so we select projects. Same thing, you get your little search icon there and um, your hand lens and probably have to take a breath, wait a minute. And then once it's there, hit it and you can enter in, start searching for Never Home Alone. And we'll click join. And it's gonna show you that you've joined something if it says leave here. So that means you're part of it. Um, if you do decide to leave, you are gonna lose the observations that you added just as an aside. So. Once you join something, you probably don't want to leave it unless you don't mind re-adding your observations. 
Um, and then once you're on a project, just kind of some fun things. There are different project tools. There's news, um, and the news is pretty neat. Um, depending on the project, people are more or less putting things out there. Um, but Never Home Alone usually has some kind of neat articles that they share or blog posts, and this will take you to them. So I recommend checking that out. Um, and then you can also see what's going on, who's uploaded things, how many observations there are. So they're approaching like 15,000. Um, and then how many different species have been added. So over 2,600, how many different people are taking part. And you can click on these things and see more information um, and scroll through. So that's, it's pretty fun um, to get lots of info there. So I think now, Emma, do you wanna to go to questions, you think? If no, we have just one at the moment. It's from Allison, who is looking to find the correct Never Home Alone project. And hopefully you found that Allison when uh, Lauren showed the photo and everything. Um, she also asks which projects on iNaturalist should we join? And I think you're getting to that a little later, some of the projects that the NAT scientists use. Yeah, I have a couple projects I'll recommend and then we'll also share them out um, in kind of a wrap up thank you email as well. But there are a lot of projects out there. So I'm going to just highlight some of the top ones, but that will be at the end. So I'm glad that you asked. Perfect. So do keep an eye out for that email. Um, Lauren is going to share some great resources with everyone for getting involved in community science projects. And we'll also be sharing a recording of tonight's talk, which you um, can definitely share with your friends and family. And that email will go out in about a week. Alrighty, so let's get down to recording observations. Now that we've joined a project, um, and you will want to join more projects later, like we said, um, but we're just going to play around with this first one right now. So hopefully during that bathroom break, you may have had time to take a photo of um, a, something living in your home, or maybe not living. Actually, Rob, um, had some really great advice when I asked him about it earlier, going to a windowsill and seeing what's in there. I know people have really, really clean houses, so nobody has any insects in their houses, but um, you know, maybe just tonight by chance something flew in and you can share that with us. Um, also taking apart your lamp. So when you clean out your lamp, there's gonna be a ton of stuff in there. Um, putting it on a white sheet and then photographing them individually is also a great way for them to see species. So if you do have an observation or some photos you took, play along. If not, just watch. Um, so you are going to go into the app, just your standard view. The um, When you open it up, there's this little camera icon at the bottom for iPhone users and for Android users, there's a little plus sign in a green circle and you will click on those to upload an observation. Now it automatically will take you to um, your camera and the iPhone and in the Android, it gives you a couple options. Um, so I personally just don't recommend taking photos with the the app itself, you can do that. So this is how you would do that. I like to take photos from my library. And the reason I do that is a lot of times when you are taking photos, you might be out on a trail, obviously not for Never Home Alone, but I also don't have the best service in my house. Um, and if you lose service, but you only have your photos in the app, then you lose those photos if you aren't able to upload them. If you have them on your phone, you can be in airplane mode and you can still be taking photos and they will be saved. So you don't have to necessarily be anywhere where there's great service. So that's why I just take them on my phone and then I delete them later. Um, so they're not taking up space on my phone. So to do that, you're gonna go to your library. So the Android or the iPhone, it's a little library icon on the bottom right there. And then Android, you're gonna tap choose image. And then this will take you to your photo library. And depending, sometimes you can select multiple at one time. Sometimes it makes you go back and forth and picking one. But multiple observations, we uh, multiple photos per observation is what we really recommend. Um, so you can see I've chosen three here of this plant. These white dots at the bottom here that are a little hard to see, but um, that means there are multiple images. And that's going to help people on the other side identify this for me. So the more images you could get, 
the better. Um, talking with Michael Wall, even about certain insects, they're hard, they're moving around. But if you can just take multiple photos of them, even if they're a little fuzzy, like ideally clear photos, yes, not always possible. Um, so you wanna upload as multiple photos so that will help people on the other end that are IDing all these things. Um, so there you go, you have your picture up top there. Um, you can tap to the left of it and you can add more from your photo library if you wanna keep adding more. And the next thing you go to is enter a species ID. So the nice thing about iNaturalist is you have don't have to know what you're looking at at all. It will, if you click in that box, the species box, um, it will actually suggest something for you and you can agree with that or you can enter in your own um, thing. It's not always right. It has really good AI, but it's not always right, um, or it might focus on the wrong thing. So enter in your own thing or agree with it, but always enter something. Um, if you don't enter something, people that are going through earlier, you might have heard Rob and Michael talking about how, you know, they have somebody doing just the beetles. Well, he's just searching for beetles. He's not looking at anything else. So he's not going to bring up something that says unknown. So if you want to get your photos in front of people that are the experts, you want to add something there. So just saying beetle totally works. Just saying insect is perfect too. Plant, there are people on the other side just waiting to jump on an ID. Um, so it's awesome. But if you don't ID it, then months, years can go by and nobody ever looks at it just because it's not coming up in their searches. So you click in there, um, oh, always suggest something and a lovely little rat, rattlesnake. And then also if you start identifying things and you realize that you like identifying while you're observing, you can go in and identify for other people too. So it's totally peer to peer. Um, as long as two people agree on an ID, then it becomes research grade and researchers can pull that into their projects. Um, but people can also overwrite things and say, I disagree. And there's some really interesting conversations that you'll see between people disagreeing on identification. So I oftentimes will just say lizard, plant, because I don't know, or I'm not sure. Um, you can add notes. So this is a kind of might be a fun place to add notes. Actually, um, some of those questions that came up might not be explicit from your picture, but you could put in here, found in shoe or in my bathroom or things like that, that also might give people clues or that wanna know um, more about where you found it. It also kind of acts as your own little personal journal because you can access these later. And so if you wanna write like north side of the hill or cloudy day, just notes for yourself too, to kind of remember, um, this is a great place for them. And then um, if there are multiple organisms in the photo, you wanna do an observation for each organism. So this was actually, I took it, this photo on a plant at a nursery and there's a caterpillar and then the fly just happened to be there as I took the photo. So I would wanna do um, two different observations, one for the caterpillar and one for the fly. The reason I'm not doing the plant is just because it, it's a planted plant at a nursery. It's not a wild plant. Um, if I did want to do one for the plant, if I wanted to try and get it ID'd because I didn't know, I would just mark it as captive cultivated and I'll show you um, how to do that in a minute. So this next one is important to people, uh, location. So when you take a photo on a smartphone, a tablet, a lot of digital cameras too, it's automatically tagging where you are, um, your latitude and longitude, and that's just in the metadata in the photo and it will upload. So you don't have to put your location in here. When you upload that photo from your phone, it's gonna automatically upload. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side, this is, is some kelp and it was taking at Coronado Beach. Um, and the Latin longitude are there and the geo privacy right below says open. So anybody that's on iNaturalist can see exactly where I took that. Well, as you might imagine, if you're taking photos in your house, you might not want people to know exactly where you are. So here, if you go to that geo privacy, you can select, select it and then hit obscured. We recommend obscured as opposed to private because obscured means the people running the project can still see it and you can still see it, 
but nobody else can see it unless they're a trusted user that you've friended on iNaturalist. Um, if you go to private, then nobody can see it and it isn't as useful for a research project. Um, they can reach out to you and ask, hey, where did you see this? But if it's not something truly remarkable, um, not to say not everything is remarkable, but if it's not something that they really, really need, they may not have that grad student that has the time to reach out to you and say, hey, where did you find this? So obscured is a way to just make it accessible to the people running the project yourself while also keeping your exact location safe. Um, and I also really recommend this if you're going out with people under the age of 18, obscure observations. It's just an easy way to be safe and it still works for everybody, still research grade. Um, so these are what the different geo privacy settings look like. You'll see actual, if people can see exactly where it is, it's like a real map, like dot on a map right there, pinpoints in. If it's obscured, it's gonna be a round and big and it actually throws it off by miles and miles. So it kind of depends on where you are in, in relation to the like poles and how much it obscures it, but it obscures it, so. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, if you find something that you want to ID that isn't wild, um, something, you know, in your neighbor's yard that maybe you want to eat or something, um, you can I select captive or cultivate. So it'll still get an ID, but people know that there isn't a wild plant growing somewhere that it doesn't belong. So I don't know, I say like passion flower or something like that, um, which could just pop up somewhere and be blown in or something. But um, if it's just in your neighbor's yard and they planted it and it didn't just pop up on its own, then it's cultivated. If you come across like a dog or a bird or something that is obviously somebody's pet, that's captive. So they don't really, people don't really need this for research purposes. So it's not, we're not asking people to upload captive or cultivated things, but you still can. You just ask that you for sure click this box so researchers aren't confused as to why there are wild parrots flying around San Diego, which there are, and they used to not be here. So this is a great little box to check. So we're not being confusing to people. Um, and then the really important part, if you want your observation to be added to projects like Never Home Alone, you will select at the very bottom projects. And then um, that will bring up all your projects. So right now, if you just added Home Alone, that's the only project that's gonna pop up in your project list. You're gonna click on that and it will turn green. That's how you know you've added your observation to that project. And then when you're all ready, uh, we rec recommend doing this probably when we're back in a service area, you can just tap share on an iPhone, on an Android, there's a little check that you tap and then it will start uploading all these guys for you. So a couple of best practices, um, as I mentioned, you wanna take multiple pictures for each individual organism that you're recording in an observation. So various angles, um, same with plants. If you can get up close, if you can get the full animal, the full plant, also get up close, different angles, especially with birds are hard, but silhouettes can help and angles can help. Um, if it's something that you can get your finger in there, if it's small enough for, um, Scale, that's also really great as long as you know that you're you're safe and you're not touching a poisonous plant or um, getting too close to a wild animal. Those are all great things to do. Um, you wanna take photos of one individual organism per observation. So make observations for each different one if there are multiple in an image, like in the background of this, they've got a poppy, we've got a bee, you would do one for each of those. Same photo, but just call it out in your notes. This one's for the bee, other one's for the puppy. Or this one's for the insect, other one's for the ant. Um, best practices also, we want those wild plants and animals, ideally. Mark anything as captive and cultivated if it's not wild. And then projects to join. So the NAT has a number of great projects. We just talked about Never Home Alone, um, not the NAT's project, but uh, Mike Wall is helping out with it. And it's really an awesome project and we need to get the numbers up in San Diego for sure. We're not pathetic 
but we're not great and we could be great San Diego. I know we could be. Um, bumblebees of San Diego County is a really fun one. Uh, this one's documenting different bumblebees around San Diego and that is one that actually Michael Wall administers. That's run by the NAT, um, the San Diego County Plant Atlas and the Imperial County Plant Atlas. Those two are both administered by our curator botany John Redman. And then we have uh, the Rascals Project, which is actually the NAT in partnership with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Um, and curator Brad Hollingsworth, he pulls those observations into his Herb Atlas. So as I mentioned before, we have the museum collections and then the iNaturalist collections together to kind of give us that really complete picture. Um, so there are those, there's a lot more out there. You can go to our sdnat.org backslash citizen science page and you'll be able to find even more projects there that you can join. And then oftentimes those projects will lead to more projects. So, and then that that's my last slide, unless we have any questions. We do have a few questions and I actually wanna start with one of my own. Thank you so much, Lauren, for going through this. You've gotten me really excited about these five projects here. What happens if I observe something that isn't a good fit for one of these projects? For example, a squirrel out in the wild. Does it, where does that observation go? Is it legitimate to make? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that is a great question. So actually you can, still make the observation people are still going to idea it. it still is going into this resource of of data and then people running different projects will might find it so if you tag something as a squirrel people that are running projects about squirrels may be searching on the back end and might find your squirrel and pull it into their project um, but so it's just great to have it up there you don't have to have you don't have to be adding to any projects um, but there are certain projects like never home alone that you really do want to add to because otherwise that's probably not going to be seen by the project because there are so many observations. Great, thank you. On the subject of Never Home Alone, we actually got a question through the chat from Dr. McHager, who was the president of the NAT for many, many years. Yeah. So it's great to see his name pop up. He was curious, um, for the Never Home Alone project, are we only doing observations indoors? Does the driveway count or the front yard? Yeah, that is a great question. So my understanding uh, with talking with um, Dr. Dunn is inside the walls of your house, inside the house. Yeah, I know. But but anything in your yard is is great also to just upload those. And those will fall into all sorts of different projects. You don't even have to have added them. There's a project that's just San Diego County biodiversity that no matter what you upload in San Diego County goes into it already. So just observing in San Diego County, you're already adding into a project and you don't have to join that one. It just happens automatically. Um, and then, you know, if you find a lizard, it may not go into Never Home Alone, but Brad might want it for, for his Herp Atlas and the Rascals project. So. I always say just add them. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Allison is wondering, how do you delete an observation? She doesn't see a trash icon. Yes, there isn't one, but if you go to, um, let me bring back images. You should be able to go um, from kind of your, your landing page. If you select an actual observation itself, there is, an edit button. So this top edit button, and that is where you can delete it is through there. That'll bring you Got to it. And then uh, Peter actually has some really useful information that he wanted to share with the group, which is that um, any recent evidence of an organism counts as an observation on INAT. So scat, tracks, nests, shells, Beaver chews, molts, etc., are all fine. I've definitely personally enjoyed doing scat observations. I always am convinced it's a mountain lion. It never is. Um, <laughs> it's, it's about the only mammal observations I've ever made. <laughs> it's a reoccurring theme that the world is a toilet, I guess. Um, but I was also going to say, um, 
if you do end up taking evidence of animal life, uh, having something in there for scale is really helpful. So with SCAT, definitely having, if you have like a quarter in your pocket, popping that out next to it, if you don't wanna put your hand next to it, um, footprints, things like that, something for scale is super, super helpful. Um, and as I mentioned before, things don't have to be alive. Like taking all the dead moths out of your lamp totally counts. So, and really any evidence of plant or animal life is, is totally, totally great. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Peter. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Michelle is wondering if iNaturalist is just a US app or if it is worldwide. So it is worldwide. Um, it has different names in different places. And if you are in a different country, when you download the app, it'll prompt you to use that. So in Mexico, it's iNaturalista. Um, and there are different affiliate names throughout the world. Um, but also if it's, say, you know, you're an American user traveling in another country, you will just stay with your network iNaturalist and upload it on there. Um, but if you're a user in Mexico, you'd use iNaturalista and that will upload to iNat as well. And it works both ways. So they all pull from each other. They just are different platforms in different countries, if that makes sense. And then they're automatically translated as well. Great, thank you. And we've mentioned the City Nature Challenge. That is a worldwide competition. Um, it's really cool to see the, the countries we're up against. And actually, I think La Paz, Bolivia was maybe one of the winners last year. Am I remembering that right? South Africa has done really well. Yes. Um, Cape Town does really well. I believe La Paz, yeah. It's, it feels like, I'm like, was that last year or 10 years ago? Because it was in April. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like another world away, um, a lifetime away. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's really fun. You can get to participate and compete against all sorts of other cities, including LA. So, need LA. Next year's our year. <laughs> um, Dan is wondering uh, about the back end. He asks, is there a way to start a project and have observations from others automatically add to that project if it fits the parameters of the project? Yeah, so when you do go to the projects page, um, I to start a project, you cannot do it on the app. You need to be online on iNaturalist.org. So there's a lot more functionality there. Um, and you would start something called an umbrella project. So that is, you're running kind of an overarching umbrella project and it's pulling in from different projects. So they can be location-based or species-based or date-based. Um, there's all sorts of different options. And there's also all sorts of tutorials on there as well and videos um, and really some great help forums. People are super helpful on there if you just ask questions. Um, in the app itself too, I meant to point out to everybody, uh, or you know what, let me click, it's towards the end. In your settings, um, so the top right here is your settings. If you go into there, there is a tutorial on getting started with iNaturalist that you might want to check out as well. Cool. Thank you, Lauren. Um, it's getting late, so I just want to wrap up with one final question, which is, can you tell us just one or two instances in which iNaturalist observations have been really impactful on research? Well, I have a couple... Um, I guess, examples just from the NAT itself, one of them being um, a, a newly documented behavior that's a part of the Herp Atlas and the Rascals Project where a coyote um, was shown predating on, so eating a rattlesnake, a red diamond rattlesnake, which hadn't been documented before, but somebody took a photo of it, um, got a really cool photo of it. You could totally tell it's a red diamond. It's got those white stripes on its tail and um, there's a coyote with it. And then also um, with the Herp Atlas, now that I think about it, um, an example of new behavior for, um, I think it's a king snake, um, predating on, on bird eggs that it hadn't been um, recorded as doing before. And so that was a, a publication came out of that, which is really exciting um, because the citizen scientist, the community scientist that observed it um, was actually a part of the research paper. And that will be the same actually with Never Home Alone. Huge contributors, um, people that are doing like large number of contributions to that will be a part of the research project and the publication as well. So that's 
super exciting, I think, to get to really see how you're adding to this collective body of knowledge that we're all learning from and so much to learn from. That is so stinking cool.